That was it. Woo that one's hot. Good morning. We'll start over. Great to see everybody here this morning. We're glad that you have chosen to worship with us at First Baptist Church, Bogota. It was a little cloudy out this morning, but it's still a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. I'm not going to tell on our pastor, but this morning's greeting says, Happy Mother's Day! He said, no, we just love our mothers so much, we're going to celebrate them every week for a while. How about that? <laughs> All right, we will have DF2 today after the song service for kids up to the fifth grade, so uh, be prepared to dismiss them when we get through singing. This Wednesday night, we're going to do things a little different from our normal Bible study time. We're going to have a celebration dinner to celebrate what we've uh, had going on for the past year, uh, and then we're going to take a break for the summer. But this Wednesday night, if you have kids or youth or if you're one of the volunteers on Wednesday nights, you're going to eat from 5 to 5.55. Everybody else that doesn't uh, fall in that category, you can wait till right at 6 o'clock to show up. We're going to have an enchilada dinner, uh, so we know the food will be delicious. Come and celebrate with us. We'll stay down there and talk about what we've done and talk about what we're going to do uh, 
down the road uh, when we pick back up. So be here again at 5 if you're in that category. Everybody else can meet at 6 and enjoy a delicious meal. Graduates, whether you're graduating from high school, college, trade school, whatever the case may be, let Brother Tim know today. I'm going to recognize all of our graduates next Sunday. And then on top of that, next Sunday at 4 p.m., we are going to actually host the baccalaureate service here at our church. Uh, so be sure and come s support those seniors uh, at 4 p.m. next Sunday afternoon. And youth, if you have not registered for summer camp, you need to see Brother Tim today. And if you have registered, your deposit of $50 is due today as well. And then Vacation Bible School. Mark your calendars for June the 12th through the 16th. There is a registration um, clipboard out there on the welcome desk, and there is a QR code that you can scan uh, for pre-registration. And if you've got any questions, you can see Miss Crystal Mills or Michelle Sanjewel for that. And if you ordered a VBS shirt, your money is due today for that as well. So get with Miss Crystal. All right. Our missions emphasis for this month is the Children's Advocacy Center in Paris. Uh, they help children that are pulled from bad or extreme situations. Um, and instead of asking for stuff, we're asking for monetary donations. So you can make a check payable to the church, and in the memo line, just put that it's for the Children's Advocacy Center. And uh, you can put that uh, back there in one of the uh, envelopes and write that on the envelope, too, and drop it in the offering plate. All right. I think I got them all. Let's stand, turn around, and greet someone. Tell them you're glad to see them this morning. voices. Sing with us.
Father, we again thank you just for the privilege of being in your house. God, we pray that as we raise our voices to worship you, that you are pleased and honored and glorified by everything that we do. God, we lift up those in our community that are sick, those that have lost loved ones. God, we just pray that your spirit would wash over them with peace. God, that your word says comes only from you. Help us to remember that your blood never loses its power. It's as powerful today as it was the day you died on that cross. God, we thank you for your resurrection, for the fact that you're coming again. Be with us today, God. Convict our hearts. Uh, change our hearts. Make us better than we were yesterday as we head into a new week. We love you and we praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. on that, I ask that you be seated this morning as our kids are dismissed at this time.
with a giant before him. Young David went to battle with only five smooth stones. Whole armies were afraid to face this giant. But David had faith in God. He did not fear. We all face giants in our lives. A difficult diagnosis. A struggling marriage. A loss of a loved one. A lost job. Friend, take courage. Your God goes before you. Today we continue the series, Five Smooth Stones. Here's part three, All That You Need, with FBC Youth Pastor Tim Meals. All right. Good morning, everyone. I just want to make sure it's over now. It just kept seeming like it kept going. All right. So y'all know how we started off here. Um, if y'all want to grab your Bibles and stand up with me, and we'll repeat um, the verse that we repeat every, every Sunday. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Awesome. That was beautiful. So, um, yes, I did get a haircut. Um, it is a weight lifted off of my shoulders, um, especially when you have so much hair that is heavy, and then you walk outside and add sweat to the matter. So it just, it was, it was getting too hot, and it needed to happen. So I, I feel good now. Like I, although, here's the thing. When you go from long hair to short hair, you tend to s still kind of do this. So if at any time today you see me do that, just know I'm trying to break out of it until like I realize I don't have the hair to do that anymore. Um, and also, I just want to let you know before we start, um, I tend to walk over here to the edge a lot. Um, I have new glasses, and my depth perception is just a little bit off this morning. So if I fall... At least make sure I'm okay before you laugh at me. Please just check and make sure everything's good. All right. So um, this morning we're continuing the series called Five S Smooth Stones. Um, this morning the title of the message is called All That You Need. Um, throughout this series we've been focusing on the story of David and Goliath. Um, today we find ourselves in the part of the, the story where David actually goes and gets these five smooth, smooth stones to, to slay the, the giant Goliath. Um, and the overall important topic or theme of this message um, today is that God wants to use what you already have. Um, sometimes if you're like me, um, you tend to look at other people's lives and want something that they have. Like, you wish you had something that someone else had. Um, it's, and, and sometimes it's enticing to believe if you had maybe a better paying job or you lived in a different zip code or you had a bigger house that if I had all that stuff, then I'd finally be able to serve God the way that he wants me to, to serve him. Sometimes we get trapped in that thought that if I had a better lifestyle or a better house or more money that I would be able to serve God better than I am now. But this condition is not a unique one, um, and sometimes that many of us understand all too well. Um, and as we're going to see in today's passage, this is a condition that goes back all the way to biblical times. There were people back in biblical times that had this thought that if I had a talent that someone else had, then I'd be able to serve God better than how I can use the talents that I have to serve God. And so, if you turn in your Bibles real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 4 through 11 real quick, and it says this. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of all of them. They are different kinds of there are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to get, give wise advice. 
To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the, per- the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. So, the Bible tells us that everyone gets a different spiritual gift. It's all unique to each individual. But here's the thing. It all comes from the same Spirit. It all comes from the same source. And that's God. And the Holy Spirit helps us see and learn what these gifts are and how God is trying to use them in our lives. So, here's the thing. We all have different gifts, but we're all given different gifts by the same God. And God wants us to use the gifts that we have to bring him glory. God doesn't want us to look at someone else and say, they got a better gift than me. I guess I can't serve God like they can. Because they have a better gift, so they can obviously serve God better than, than I can. That's not how it works. God specifically gave your gift to you. And it's unique to you. And he wants you to use that gift to serve him as he intends you to do. So, as we dive into the, to the message of the, the story of David, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's where we're going to spend the bulk of the time today in. Um, I just want you to think of how this story might change, might have changed if David would have spent his time as he gets out to the battlefield, um, if he would have spent the time envying those around him in the Israelite army, or maybe even envying the physical strength that Goliath had. He could have spent there and he could have, he could have stood there and saw Goliath and be like, man, if I was that buff, that'd be nice. He could have just stood there and said, man, I wish I had the physical caliber of Goliath. I wish I had the, the might of this Israelite army. I wish I was like them. I wish I was more like them. David could have done that, and the story would have been completely different. But David doesn't focus on what he doesn't have. He focuses on what he has. And in his case, he had five stones and a sling. So let's see what happens. First, First Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 32. And it says this. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I, try, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine. Saul finally cons- consented, all right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave to David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of ma- mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took two, a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five stu- smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd bag. Then, armed with only his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley towards the Philistine. Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this rubby-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come with me at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his God, gods. Come over here, and I'll give you your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. 
David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's, heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will c- kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled there here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give us give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with, in, with his sling and hit the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell down, fell, fell face down on the ground. So da- David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his own head. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this message that you're about to give us, God. Please let it be your words that are spoken this morning, God. Prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for the message that we're about to receive, God. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. So there's a lot going on in this passage. I know that was a lot to, to take in. Um, and, and I encourage you to also go home and read it sometime for your own, uh, so that way you can kind of take it verse by verse. But we're going to kind of just break it down into three specific points this morning. Um, but so, so what we see tonight, what we see this morning is we, this highlights the call upon David's life to fight Goliath. This is when he finally, we've been leading up to this moment, this is when he finally says, hey, I'm going out, I'm going to fight Goliath, and then he takes five stu- smooth stones and his slingshot, and he goes out and he fights Goliath, and all he does is give him one lick of a stone, and Goliath falls down, knocked out, and then he goes over, takes his sword, and cuts off his own head. So that's the story. Um, the, 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 this morning, what we're going to see is what leads up to this moment that allows him to, um, to stand up and face Goliath. We're going to see three things that... Um, from the moment David said, hey, I'm going to do it, to the moment he actually did it. There's three things that happens, or three things that David does and David realizes in this moment. And these are three things that I believe that God is calling us to do today, three things that we need to realize and apply to our own lives. And the first one being, the first point that we're going to see this morning is that David blocked out the white noise. Um, If you look at the beginning of this passage... You see that David declares, hey, I'm going to go fight Goliath. This little shepherd boy who wasn't even in the army just comes to take his brother's lunch and to kind of check on his brothers for his dad ends up saying, hey, I'm going to fight this guy that none of y'all want to fight. But the Bible tells us that after he says this, Saul responds to him and he says, you're not able to fight this Philistine. You're, You're only a young boy. This dude has been a warrior since he was younger than you. This dude has spent his whole life training to be a fighter. You're just a little kid. So for most of us, that sounds like a voice that would kind of hold us back, kind of make us think twice, maybe um, make us think about not doing what it is that we're setting out to do. Two weeks ago, we talked about those who will try and hold us back and look down upon us. Um, There are many in our lives that, regardless of what we do, who will try and keep us from where we need to go. There, there There are people who are stumbling blocks in our lives. You're you're gonna encounter them. It's just it's just the way of life. There are gonna be people that, when you come to them and say, "Hey, man, I got this." awesome, awesome idea. I, I feel like God is leading me to do this. It's going to be great. We're going we're gonna to change the world. They're going to be like, nah, no. Y- you can't do that. You're not, you're not s- equipped to do it. You're not skilled enough to do it. And people are going to do that. P- there are going to be people in your life that try and talk you out of following the plans that God has for your life. That's what Saul is, try, uh, Saul is trying to do here. God was going to use David to kill Goliath, but Saul is trying to talk him out of it. And there are going to be people in your life that do that. 
We looked at 1 Timothy um, 4, verse 12, that says, don't look down upon them because they're young. No one should look down upon the young people. And, and believe it or not, I'm going I'm to speak for the young people because I am one. Here's the thing. If you look at a lot of the, the great revivals in the last handful of generations, most of them were started by college kids, by young people, by teenagers. A lot of the greatest revivals to happen for God in our country were started by young people. Young people can make a difference. So don't look down upon them because of their youth. But find ways to build them up, encourage them, train them, lead them, so that they can be part of the next greatest revival that we have in our country. But Saul, in this moment, was looking down on David because he was young. So what is David supposed to do in this moment? His brothers won't have it. Others are simply ignoring him. And Saul doesn't think he's, he stands a chance at success for the task that is before him. So pretty much the entire Israelite army is like, man, you can't do that. You're not going to do that. You're going to fail. You're not, you're not going to succeed. No one was behind David. None of the army, not even Saul, was behind, believed um, David could do it. But here's the thing. To, to David, this was all just white noise in the midst of God's clear call and command on his life. So what is white noise? Well, um, the, the description of white noise is a type of noise that is produced by combining sounds of all different frequencies together. So kind of like static on your TV, just a bunch of different random noises kind of thrown together and it makes white noise. Um, so if you take that and apply it to your spiritual life, there are many different voices around you that are begging for airtime in your life. And it all just sounds like white noise because there's a voice coming from the media. There's a voice coming from your friends, a voice coming from your coworkers, your boss, your parents, your teachers, your classmates, um, whoever. There's voices coming at, at you from all different directions. And they're all wanting you to listen to them. They're all wanting to control your life. And if you're not careful, what ends up happening is we get bogged down and overwhelmed by all these voices. And we start to listen to them, and we let them control how we live our lives. But that's why it's important for us to, to learn to discern God's voice from other voices. Do you, did you know that some of these voices have learned how to sound like they're from God when they're really not? There are some voices that have tricked you into believing that they're from God and that God approves of this. But then if you open your Bible and you read the Word, you start to realize this is not from God. This is something else trying to trick me, to, to make me think that it's the right way when it's really the not, not the right way. But we have to learn to discern God's voice from other voices. That's why we have to learn and study and read the Word of God so that we know what God's voice is telling us and which one is God's voice. Because God's voice will never, ever, ever contradict the Word that He has given us already. If it lines up with the Word of God, then it's from God. If it doesn't, it's not. So we have to learn to sort through the different voices that are in our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit might lead us to ask questions of the voices that arise in our life. Like, does this, this, does this voice actually care about me? Is this a godly voice? Does this voice hold wisdom? When we ask these questions, it, it helps us to discern which voice is ultimately listen, we ultimately need to listen to and trust. Like if you have someone who's coming to you, because here's the thing, as we learned a few weeks ago, God will send people into your life to help you along the way. He will send people into your life to encourage you. But 
we need to, uh, we need to ask ourselves, is the thing they're saying, are they godly things? Do they have wisdom? Do, does this person, what they're saying, does it show that they care about me and they, they want my well-being and they want me to succeed and they want me to complete the plans that God has laid before me? So we need to ask ourselves these questions. So in David's story, if you actually look at verses 34 through 36, you see that he clearly was able to shake off the words from Saul and from the others in the camp and stay focused on what God was leading him to do. He was able to, to put, sit aside all the noise that was coming at him from Saul, the, the, the rest of the army, and everyone, even Goliath, who was taunting him at this time. And it says, but David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this with both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So hearing these words should just bold confidence in us. Give us confidence. David, David is so focused on the task, it, it just gives, it, 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 it should just give the rest of the, the Israelite army confidence to say, hey, I'm following David. This guy's, like, he's on fire. He's going for it. I want to follow after that guy. He's just oozing with confidence. He's like, but what he's saying is, hey, I know that God's got me right now because he's already got me in the past. He's led me in, in other areas of my life, when, when a lion or a bear would come take a sheep, God would be with me when I go out and defeat the lion or the, the bear that took my sheep. God was with him. He had seen God deliver him time and time again from the wild beasts, and he had no doubt that God would do it again in his current situation. So that leads me to my second point. Remember where you've been. Remember what God has already done for you. So if you read, if you read the Bible, there are countless of individuals in the Bible who, for what was in their, who were being prepared for what was to come in their future with their current circumstances and suffering. So take Joseph's story, for example. Um, this is one that most of y'all probably have heard many times before, but we find that Joseph was falsely imprisoned in a foreign land, but yet ends up serving as the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. But as you read Joseph's story, you can clearly see that God was at work throughout the whole story. Whether, whether others could see it or not, God was at work in the story of Joseph. In fact, the story of Joseph concludes with this moment that he has with his brothers, and he, he speaks these powerful words that reveals how God was at work in his life. And he says this in Genesis 50, verses 19 and 20. It says this, But Joseph replied, Do not be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. So we see that God was with Joseph the whole time when he was thrown in the pit, taken out of the pit, sold into slavery, was in Potiphar's house, was falsely accused of um, having a relationship with Potiphar's wife, was thrown into prison, was in prison for a long time. He rose up in prison and became one of the most powerful men in the prison. Then he was taken out of prison and was put in charge of pretty much all of Egypt. He was the second most powerful man in Egypt. And all along the way, while, while Joseph is experiencing all this, God is putting, is putting his plan at work this whole time. There is nothing that happened to Joseph that was not part of God's plan. And, and what we see is that God was preparing Joseph when he was in the pit being sold into slavery, when he was in prison and, and witnessing to the, the people who were in prison. God was preparing him in those moments for the task that he had set before him, which was to be second in command in all of Egypt. He was preparing him along the way for the task that he ultimately had for him, which ultimately it boils down to this. He led Egypt through a time of seven years of famine, a great famine. 
And he saved so many people because of what he was able to do because God put him where he needed to be and prepared him for what he needed to do. So God was with Joseph all along just as God was with David all along. And the amazing thing is the same is true for us today even in the seasons where you can't feel God. You, where, where you feel like just getting down on your knees and crying out, God, where are you? Even in those moments, God is at work in your life. God is preparing you for something. So even today, maybe the first step is learning to understand God's call, to understanding God's call in your life, maybe looking backwards to see what God has already done in your life. In fact, this was a command many times in the Old Testament to the, to the Israelite people. In fact, we just got um, finished in, in our Sunday school class, we just got finished with Joshua and Judges. And a big thing in Joshua and Judges is this reoccurring thing to remember what God has done. That's a big thing in Joshua and Judges. God keeps telling the people, remember, remember, remember what I've done for you. And here's the thing, spoiler alert, they keep forgetting time and time and time and time and time again. But God wants them to remember Genesis 50 verses 19 and 20. Oh no, wait. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you will obey his commands. Remember, remember. And God's telling you that today. Hey, if you're struggling with something now, look and see what I've already done for you. Look and see how I've taken care of you, how I've led you, how I've helped you how I've blessed you in the past, and remember that I'm still here today. Because sometimes, like I said, sometimes when we're going through difficult situations, it's easy for us to fall on our face and say, God, where are you? But instead of questioning if God's there, take time to remember what he's already done for you in the past. Remember where we have been is meant to give us strength and confidence in where we are now. Seeking God, God's work in and through our past gives us strength and confidence for what, what, whatever we face today. And as we stand in confidence, we can be like David in verse 37 when he says, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bears and of the bears will rescue me from this Philistine. David had the confidence because he's seen God work in his life before to say, hey, just like God rescued me from the bear, just like he rescued me from the lion, he will also deliver me out of the hands of this Philistine. So I don't fear the Philistine because I know that God has my back and God is on my side. David held in his heart the collective memory of all that God had done for him. Before he even picked up his stone and his sling, he already, he already carried the memory as a deliverance and triumph in his young life. So that leads me to my third point. And the, the, the thing that David realized is that he had all that he needed. He had all that he needed. Look at verse 38 through 40. In 1 Samuel ch chapter 17. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it would, was like, for he had never worn such a thing. Um, I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five st smooth stones from a stream and put them in his shepherd bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. So now we see in this moment that Saul is trying to mold or shape David into a, the form of a proper soldier fitted with the helmet, armor, and sword. So Saul was try, trying to dress him up in his armor to make David more of a, 
a warrior. He, he was trying to give himself something to make him more of a fighter, or appear more of a fighter. But David quickly realized that this new outfit was not going to work for him, that he did not need it, and he did not need it for the battle. And so he takes it off, grabs five stones, and walks out into battle. But here's the thing he realized. He was, just as he arrived, sufficiently prepared to face Goliath. He didn't need any of that extra stuff. So David realized that all he had was all that he needed. That he didn't need an armor, his armor. He didn't need a sword to defeat Goliath. He realized that all he had was all that he needed. And, and many of us at, at one point in time in our life have, have probably tried to be someone else. Um, sometimes we try and act like someone else or maybe even dress like someone else. Um, so, and Because we, we want to be someone else. We try and fit ourselves into someone else's story, and, and we try and do that to, to better our own story. Because sometimes we feel like we're just not important enough or not significant enough, and so we try to pretend to be someone else that we look up to and be like, that person has it all. People love that person. Um, they're, they, they, they're more useful in life. So let me try and be like them. Maybe they speak better. Maybe they, they, they're more talented, whatever. So we try and act like them. We try and be like them. And that's what we see Saul was trying to do. Saul was trying to make David into him. But David learned we don't need all that. In fact, all that you presently have in your possession is all that you need to sufficiently serve God. Think of the, think of the story of when Jesus fed the 5,000. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the full story, but I encourage you to go home and read Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. I'm not going to read it all today, but I'm going to give you a little summary of it. Um, so what happens is the disciples begin to worry because there's a bunch of people fe- following him. Um, and now when it says Jesus fed the 5,000, that's just talking about men, because all they counted was the men. That's not including women and children. So I, I sometimes think, and a lot of people speculate, that it was more about um, fifteen to 20,000 people once you actually include women and children. So it was a lot of people. Um, so there's a lot of people following Jesus, and the disciples are wondering, how are we going to feed all these people? And we see Jesus asked them to gather together what they already had. So Jesus says, hey, go collect what we have. He doesn't say, hey, go down to the market, go down to the store, go down to McDonald's or Subway and grab some food. He says, hey, go to the people and collect what we have. So he says, hey, go get what we already have. Now, obviously, Jesus is going to perform a miracle and feed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But what if that's exactly what God is trying to teach us through the story of David and Goliath today? That what we have is really all that we need. What God has given you in your life is all that you need to serve him. To bring him glory. To bring him honor. To fulfill the plans that he has for your life. What if all you have is all you need? What if we stopped having the mentality, it's like, oh, if I only had a little bit more money, if I had a better job, if I had a better house, if I had this, this, or this, or X, Y, and Z, if I had all that stuff, then I would be able to serve God better, or I would be able to to do better for God. But here's the thing, if we're all honest, when we achieve X, Y, or Z, or this, or this, it doesn't make us better servants of God. It just makes us the same person we war- were, but with more stuff, or a better house. Our, our attitude towards God doesn't change if we get more stuff, or have a better house, or have more money. It just makes us the same person with a better house or more money. But when we realize that all we have right now is all that we need to be what God has called us to be, that's when things start to change. When you start to realize, like, hey, I don't need all this stuff to be, to, be, to be used by God. I can be used by God right where I'm at with what I have right now, with however much money I have in my bank account right now. Like, I don't need a bigger house. I don't need more money. I don't need to live in a different zip code. I don't need, 
this, this, or this. I can serve God right here, right now with what God has already given me. That's when things start to happen for the glory of God. What if God is trying to help you see the miraculous things that he can do in and through your life when you simply bring him the ordinary, everyday stuff that you have to offer? So David puts aside all this extra stuff because he doesn't need this armor. Um, in fact, how many, I'm just going to go a little old school one for, for this one. How many of y'all have ever seen the Veggie Tales when he, um, David fights the giant pickle? Anyone? I love the old school veggie tales. They're a lot better than the new one. But in the scene where when David or Larry is the cucumber that puts it on, he, the, the armor that he has was deemed Saul's armor, and Saul was a lot bigger person than David was. And so when David puts the armor on, it's Saul's armor, which kind of makes David look like he kind of disappears because it's so much bigger than he is. I, I, but he puts it on, he's like, I don't need this. I don't need this. And he put, takes it off and he grabs five stones in his slingshot. He added that to the faith that he had developed over time serving God and his family in the wilderness. And he walks out into battle to face Goliath. Through all the white noise, through all the doubt, through the fear, and he goes into victory. All that he had was all that God had already given him. And that's all that he needed, was what God had already given him. And it's a powerful thing that when we start believing, you already have all that you need. There's a lot of us here today who, feel, who may feel trapped in an endless loop of white noise there, there, there are just too many voices honing in on our lives to, to focus anymore. There's too many options. There's too many experiences of shame, regret, and defeat for us to confidently move ahead into all that God has for us. And as we kind of wrap up today and close today, um, guys, if that's you this morning, if you feel like you're just being bogged down because of your past, God might be calling you today to say, hey, I need to lay down my past so I can go forth into what God has planned for me. Maybe you're being bogged down by all the white noise, all the all, your, your friends, friend groups, your um, boss, your whatever, whatever, whatever. Whoever is yelling at you with all this noise, maybe God is saying, hey, today you need to learn to discern my voice from their voice. Block out all the noise. If that sounds like you today, then I encourage you to do all you can to shut out all the other things and focus on God. Try to have, like David did, a, singular, a singularly focused mind on the power and majesty of God. Try to become a person after the very heart of God. The Bible describes David after a man after God's own heart. What if we were like that? What if we became so focused on what God is saying and doing that it allows us to tune out all the other noise? What if we become so focused on what God is doing and saying that we don't even hear all the other noise? It becomes like a blur in the background. That's what David did. He was so focused on God that all the the noise that was just there to tear him down he wasn't even focused on it he didn't even let it phase him he did what he came to do what God had called him to do and he did it all the way to victory others of you may have simply forgotten all that God has done for you in the past to get you to where you are today if that's you then I encourage you to take some time this week in fact, don't even wait till this week. As soon as you get home, sit down and do it. Sit down and write in a journal or something all the miracles that God has worked in your life on your behalf. And, and, and here's, here's, a, here's a quote that I want to give to you. Your testimony has power. 
Your testimony is your superpower. So don't ever forget that. Your testimony has power. And, and here, here's what I always like to tell people. If you've gone through something and God has led you out of it, he wants you to share that with somebody else. Because there's probably someone else in your life that is going through what you went through. And they need help to get out of it. And, they, and maybe God is telling you to like, hey, go bring me to them. Go be my hands and feet for them. Go be in their lives. Go walk alongside them. Maybe that's what God is calling you to do today with something that you've had in your past. And he's like, hey, go help this person because they're dealing with what you've dealt with. But write down in a journal what God has done for you in your life. It might be a small thing. It might be a big thing. But write it down because it's all important. Because here's the thing, one day you might be that person on your hands and feet saying, God, where are you? And then all you have to do is take out that journal and be like, God, you're still here because you've taken care of me in the past and you're still going to take care of me today. And lastly, all of us need to stop looking at everything everyone else has access to and we need to focus on what God has given us to work with. You have gifts that are individual and unique to you. So maybe it's time to pick them up and head into the victory God has for you. So stop waiting for better stuff. Stop waiting for, stop fantasizing over what someone else has and say what I have is all that I need. And let's get to work. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this message that you've given us today. God, I pray that we as Christians are able to t tune out the noise of, that are try that, that, that's there to just bring us down, to keep us from serving you, God. The voices of the enemy that try and tell us that we're not good enough, maybe we're too young, maybe we're not talented enough, maybe we're just not all put together, God. But the good thing about that is, God, you use broken people. You use everyday, ordinary people to perform great miracles. And I pray that you use us today, God. Use us in this community, God. Let us tune out the noise of the doubters, of the people who say, hey, you're not good enough to do it. Just tune those out and focus on you, God. Focus on your voice so that we can do great and mighty things in your name that bring you glory and honor, God. Let's make your name known in Bogota, in, in Texas, in the United States, God. Let us be a, a people on fire for you who, who say, hey, I'm going to block out all the noise and I'm going to go into battle. It's what you call us to do, God. I pray that we realize that we don't need flashy things. We don't need better things. We don't need more money or nicer houses, God. Because you've given us all that we need, God. And you call us to serve us, to serve you with what we have, God. And I pray that we realize that all we have is all that we need, God. And that right where you put us, right here, right now, you are calling us to do something, God. And I pray that we step up and step out of our comfort zones, out of our um, life of being obsessed with what other people have, God, and our life of wanting more and just realize, that, God, that you are enough and you've given us all that we need, God. I pray that today that we step up and we step out, God. Let us be on fire for you, God. And it's in your great name we pray. Amen.